Okay, well here goes nothing. This was not the video I planned for this week. Like half the internet, I have been popcorn dot gifing my way through the all three hours and 48 minutes of Jenny Nicholson's video on the immersive roleplay based theme park Evermore. And what surprised me was that although many of their issues were really big and obvious, a lot of them were not unique. In fact, if you asked me to make a numbered list of reasons a LARP I know nothing about might be bad, it'd look not dissimilar to some sections of that video. Initially, when one of my friends was like, I reckon you could do a video about this, I was reluctant since I have not been to the park and probably never will, so, so I don't actually have that context. But honestly, Jenny's video was so detailed and thought-provoking that I don't think a lot of the talking points need additional context if you take them into the realm of LARP, and I have been to a lot of LARP. For those of you who are new here, here. Hi, my name's Ash, and on this channel we talk about the fun of costuming and live-action roleplay. And I swore I wasn't doing another video essay for a while after The Hobbit video got so many deeply weird comments. Thanks, Jenny. Part 1. The Pitch. Jenny did really nice different costumes for each section. I don't feel very well, so I'm not doing that, but I guess different hats. Who would pitch an outrageously ambitious project before they'd done any of the basic logistics? Like 50% of LARP creators. I have seen and played a substantial number of games that followed the exact same basic pattern. Someone has a cool idea for a LARP, writes a pitch, including a date for when the LARP will run, creates a Facebook group, gets all their friends hype and potentially even starts taking money, and then starts sorting out logistics and crew and actually writing the game. This has produced some of the most uniquely bad LARP experiences I have ever had. Okay, to start, if you don't have a site and a caterer at least provisionally booked in, you don't have an event date. Don't announce a date that you're going to have to change. A lot of people want to try and avoid weekends when their players are already at other events, and honestly that might work now, but pre-pandemic, especially if you were running in March or October, you can't exclusive hire youth hostels and it's tricky to get scout camps between April and September, plus that's when the fest games run, so March and October were six-way clashes every weekend. It's not possible. Book your venue and then see who of your players can come. Obviously you're going to have to try and be responsive to key crew, but you should already have those guys in place, right? Right? Also, if you don't have a site and a caterer, I might not want to go once you announce what they are. There are sites and caterers I just won't deal with anymore, and I don't have serious dietary requirements or physical access needs, at least not most of the time. But beyond the basic logistical stuff, the vast majority of LARPs let players book on before they've written the game. It may not be possible to fully write the game without player input. I've been to a few events where there was an overarching plot, but 80% of the side plot and details feeding into that main plot were from people's character backgrounds that players had written. And and that's both quite difficult and really rewarding when you can do it for everyone. You have to be able to do it for everyone if you're going to do that. More on that later. But if you write three paragraphs of pitch and then let people book and then write the rest of the game, you've already laid out in brief what you think the themes and tone and unique selling points of the LARP will be, and now you have to write the whole game sticking to those themes and tones and USP. You can't throw out things that aren't working if they were in the original pitch. You can't follow up on new ideas and interesting changes because you have to stick to the script. You have to pull off the themes and tone that you originally conceived. I mean, I say that, nobody does. Absolutely no LARP creator in the history of LARP has stuck exactly to what was promised in the original pitch. So either your game is a compromise between what you should be doing and what you actually wanted to write eight months later, and it is to some degree bad because compromises are always unsatisfactory, or you've lost sight or completely thrown out what was in the original pitch and now your players are not at the game they thought they were at, and that's never good for player experience. Also, I don't have a good place for this anywhere else, so big dramatic twists in LARP massively overrated. I am so done with putting in all this work on costume and character background and links and planning, only to get to a LARP, find out that all of that is meaningless or even a hindrance after the first six hours. Don't pitch me a fancy dinner party if you know full well that it's going to be a survival horror by midnight. You will get players who do not want to play a survival horror and have a crappy experience and bring the whole tone down. You don't have to give away the whole plot, but you do have to tell people what your game actually is, which you can't do if you haven't written it yet. You need to have the bulk of the work done on the game before you start letting people book both so that the game will actually happen when you say it's going to, so that it'll be the game you promise, and so that you're not frantically scrabbling to finish it two weeks before 40 people show up to YHA and expect a full weekend of entertainment. Part 2. The Creator This is not actually a specific judgement on Evermore so much as a what this situation reminded me of. The guy behind Evermore sounds like he got in over his head and made some weird choices but isn't like actively malicious. Same is not true of some of the people behind LARP. We have a big problem in LARP with head game runners and I'm honestly not sure how we've got here? With a tabletop role-playing game, sure. You get plenty of self-centered game masters with a lot of faults, but you also get loads of people who understand that as the person running the game, you are providing a service for the benefit of the players, and the player's experience is key here. It's a fairly even distribution, and honestly, if you don't make your players feel like they're important 
and matter and enjoy your game, they'll stop playing with you. LARP runners, in my experience, skew quite heavily towards the self-centered, and we don't stop playing their games. In fact, people will enthusiastically promote and advocate for game runners who, quite frankly, wouldn't give a shit about them if they stopped stroking their ego. Here's an incomplete list of game runner red flags. They talk about wanting to tell a story, like they don't understand that it's the players of a LARP who tell the story, not the game runner. They cast their closest friends as long insert NPCs with huge abilities to influence the plot, but don't charge them player rates, or they only hand plot to players they're already friends with. They get grumpy or frustrated when people ask questions either about rules or plot, or when things don't go according to plan. It's a LARP, no plan survives contact with the player base. And people have questions, that's normal. They don't explain their rules properly and then get mad when people get things wrong. They won't delegate. They constantly complain about being stressed or bring their personal life up to deflect from criticism. They constantly deflect criticism. They people please to the extent that they won't tell anybody no and therefore agree to things that either substantially change the gameplay experience, seriously disadvantage other players, contradict things they've already agreed with other players, won't actually be supported in gameplay, etc. They delegate too much because they don't want to do any of the writing, logistics, or crew management, and then get mad because their vision wasn't realized. They try and create a vision, or set piece, or highly detailed tableau, forgetting that a vision is not a gameplay experience and players need to interact with this nonsense. Uh, they harass people. I wish that one wasn't on this list, but yeah, sometimes, turns out, predators like positions of authority. Who knew? Everyone. Uh, everyone knew. This is one of those things that's kind of, you can't preemptively correct for people being awful. I think it's fairly rare, but it happens, and you can stop attending and promoting their games when you find out. Now I want to be clear, I've had loads of great game runners too. People who've been supportive, accommodating, who've written great plot lines, rolled with the punches, tried to include people, responded to criticism, been professional, and accepted that their rules are kind of complex, it's fine, do your best, we'll all be understanding and learn together. I don't have a problem with rules, I have a problem when you treat me like I'm stupid for not reading your mind. Being a LARP game runner is not being a novelist or an architect or even a tabletop game writer. It's a stressful and demanding and kind of thankless customer service role. So maybe don't do it if you're not up to handling a stressful and demanding customer service role where people will tell you it's not working all the time. But I keep seeing people telling brand new LARPers that they should come to games where I think they're going to have a bad time, because I did. We keep booking out games from people who have bad reputations and we keep paying to show up to events where you probably just have to make your own fun. I will accept that from Empire, not a £150 weekend game with 30 players where I'm supposed to be someone important. And we need to stop doing this. Part three, the land. Just because you can private hire a site doesn't mean it will be good for a LARP, or good for your specific LARP. Here is an incomplete list of things that have happened at LARP sites I've been at. Having to explain LARP to dog walkers because the public right of way went directly past the space we were using for combat encounters and the crew weren't handling that. Having to deflect passers-by because the outdoor space was separated from a very popular public park by a low wall and tourists assumed we were reenactors they could interact with and the crew weren't handling that. Black mold! Someone getting lost in the woods because players were actively encouraged to explore a high threat area that was also large, heavily wooded, topologically difficult, had very few clear paths, no phone signal, in the middle of the night, with minimal crew presence, absolutely no checks on footwear, kit or player fitness to navigate, and absolutely no headcounts. So like, not entirely the site's fault, but definitely a mismatch between game style, site and crew ability. The site had a dog that was allowed to free roam for a high combat system that made enthusiastic use of thrown projectiles. The dog was extremely cute and friendly. Areas lined with deep ditches or waterways used for major combat encounters. No heating or broken heating. A high combat game with a comparably modern technology level and thus prop guns and fake drugs on a site overlooked by residential properties with a noise curfew. Flickering lights. A no outdoor shoes indoors rule, which would have been fine except for the game featured periodic and unannounced waves of monsters attacking the front door and thus folks were either struggling to get their outdoor boots on in a hurry so they could deal with that, fighting indoors in socks on polished wooden floors, or hanging around outside getting cold. Toilets only accessible by going through the sleeping quarters. Toilets that don't work or worked inconsistently. Showers that don't work or worked inconsistently. The only showers being in communal spaces. Condensation. Bad signposting on entrances and exits, meaning that what seemed like the main way into the parking was in fact not quite big enough for an average sized car. The main area for role playing, eating, and hanging out also being where the sleeping accommodation was. A creepy village. The site obviously did outdoor stuff for kids and I think it was part of like the teaching area or something. That one honestly would have been cool if we'd been using it, but we weren't and it was kind of roped off so it was just sort of there being empty and ominously haunted looking. Not a learning point, just an observation. This is without getting into people misrepresenting sites or not doing their research or just 
not caring. There's a few very popular locations that are very physically inaccessible, and yet people keep using them for games that would otherwise be fully accessible to, for example, someone in a wheelchair, because they're pretty. There's also a couple of sites that don't have electricity or running water. Fine if you're only trying to attract experienced campers who are very physically able. Kind of rough if your game would otherwise be really appealing to people who can't cope with that. Your site has to be suitable not only for LARP, some of the LARP sites I have been to are not suitable for LARP, but suitable for the specific game you are running. Part 4. The Return Wow, who would open a theme park with a reduced offering, incomplete fixtures and no testing to see if gameplay actually worked and was worthwhile for people to engage in? Play test your game. I don't care if you run a reduced event zero so you live test with players but it's emphatically not part of the main canon, or run the game for your friends in your living room, or run it over Zoom. Even if your game has no mechanics, play test your game. Event 1 cannot be the first time your game meets people who haven't lived inside it for however long. Running it past other people for input and getting those specific friends to try and break your mechanics, we all know that one friend who can find a loophole in a system, is great, but it's not a replacement for actually playing the game with people who have the same level of information and understanding as your eventual players will do. You will not know if you have enough plot, or if the things you think people will debate over actually work, or if your NPCs are any good, or if there's a glaring inconsistency in your IC history, or if the combat mechanics are just broken, or if creating a character is really needlessly hard, unless you've actually run the game. You should not launch an untested product. You should not run a game for the first time trapped in a YHA for a full weekend with paying players who've travelled and invested dozens of hours and a lot of money into kit and preparation. I have a spectacular track record in playing event one of a new campaign system and never coming back, and more than 50% of the time it's because these people have no idea what they're doing and haven't tested anything. And maybe eventually it'll be good. I do not know when it will be good, but I'm not prepared to keep sinking time and energy and money into it until it is. Playtest your game. Part 5. Law. I'm worried I don't have enough hats for this. If someone was like, hey, want to come to the law event, would you assume you were getting yourself in for a fae themed Halloween event? No? So why do we do this at LARP? LARP naming is an art, not a science, evidenced by the rotating series of trends. We had the single ominous sounding Latin word era, the something ampersand something era, with and without alliteration, the portmanteau era, the couple of words from a Shakespeare quote era, the name it after your IC country, a word that people almost certainly don't know how to pronounce era. We're not actually going general public and small children for LARP names, so you really don't have to call your seasonal winter festival event Wintermas, but equally calling it mythic isn't going to convey a lot of nuance. What I'm saying is you have people you're talking to about your LARP, maybe workshop the name a bit? And that goes for names of things within your game world too. Can all your crew pronounce the name of the magic system, or the wizard, or the nearest city? Do they all do it the same way? Therefore, are the players going to be able to? I've been guilty of this in the past. A system allowed character generated factions, not sure I recommend this having seen how it played out, and I was like, I love my Scottish heritage, let's do everything in Gaelic. <sighs> I queue an entire weekend of nobody, including the crew, being able to pronounce any of our names. It was a disaster, and honestly, how are people supposed to include you in stuff when they can't remember what your character is called? How are people going to remember to book your game if the name is unpronounceable, not descriptive of the name itself, or just so generic that they don't remember it? Part 6. <laughs> plague. I really don't want to talk about the effect of the pandemic on LARP. The short version is very much not recovered yet, it's much more difficult to run games and players are being very cautious. Honestly, a return to normal feels like it's going to take years and neither bemoaning that or trying to force it is actually going to help. But this section of the Jenny Nicholson video was mostly about debt, so let's talk money for a second. A lot of LARP organisers, and I mean a lot, maintain some weird double standard where they'll sell you a ticket or let you make a booking and then maintain that they haven't actually sold you a ticket, you're covering your share of food and site or whatever, you're not a customer. <laughs> if that's true, publish the numbers, break down what I'm paying for a share of, like a Kickstarter campaign. If I'm paying for a share, I deserve to know what that share is, otherwise it just sounds like you're avoiding responsibility for the people who've handed over a not insubstantial amount of money to attend your event. Quite frankly, if you have a LARP business name that you run events under, you have no right claiming that you're not selling tickets and having customers. Controversial opinion, but I think 
think a big push to get LARPs to publish their accounts would be really positive for the LARP scene in general for this non-ordered list of reasons. People would understand what their money was going towards, as a single amount with no breakdown does not in any way feel like paying for a share of food and sight, and does feel an awful lot like purchasing a ticket as a customer. LARP organisers would be required to actually keep track of their accounts and not just pour their own money into projects. People would realise the colossal amount of unpaid labour that goes into running LARP games and start asking questions like, there were some really specific props at this game that you don't appear to have paid anybody for. Where did they come from? More on that later. LARP organisers would realise how big the hole in their budget is and potentially how badly they are uncharging for their games. People who are interested in being LARP runners would understand what they were getting themselves in for and also that handling thousands of pounds in a number of transactions is a big deal and needs to be taken seriously. And no, you can't just shove that through your personal PayPal friends and family account and hope for the best. And that you better have a grand or two in hand to stump up for a site deposit. Because I have played a lot of games where I either could not explain where the money had gone or could not explain where the money had come from. And both of those are weird and worrying. Above and beyond the large number of games who seem to think they were doing me a favour by allowing me to give them money and then spend a lot on transport and costume and were not in fact responsible for my experience in any way. Part 7. LARP v Swift. I'm gonna make so many people mad with this video. <laughs> okay, so one controversial topic to another. No LARP is out there suing or being sued by Taylor Swift, but oh boy, feels like it's only a matter of time. Inventing a whole LARP game or setting from scratch is hard, I get that, but you can't just use someone else's world and lore and not ask permission. There is a lot of LARP that takes its story and world and lore from video games, books, TV series, movies, etc. And if you don't have permission from the creators to do that, that, that's probably illegal. I say probably because the grey area of fan works generally gets cited here and I want to remind everyone it's kind of hard to pass it off as a fan work if you're charging money for it. I don't think these are going away anytime soon but I also think it's a matter of time before someone actually gets sent to cease and desist. But also let's be real, if you're using someone else's stuff you don't have a leg to stand on when they're like hey you've stolen my stuff and you're selling tickets to it. See previous point about nobody believing that you're not selling tickets. We've coasted by this far by just being too small and anonymous, but dear god, we can't go on like this. Don't be the first person to get sued for copyright infringement. That's gonna suck. Normally I'm saying don't be the first person to have someone die at your LARP. Not to mention many of the specific property themed LARPs I've been to a while ago, I don't do that anymore on principle, not legal principle, they've just all been bad, that didn't have permission from the creator to run it have been not really all that faithful to the tone and setting of the source material. If you're going off piece to just go fully off and don't claim you're still running a movie movie franchise X LARP. Just cite it as an influence. Part 8. Marketing. I need to put wizard on the front of this one. Marketing is hard and costs money and most LARPs that aren't the big fest events are marketed based on word of mouth, which honestly is understandable but completely sucks for new LARPers, especially if established LARPers are incentivized not to advertise your LARP because it keeps selling out and they might not get a place. And let's be honest, the word of mouth thing doesn't always work that well and then you have people going, why aren't people booking my LARP? If there are 40 people in your Facebook group and you have 30 spaces, trust me, that math is not in your favour. Not to mention the never-ending stream of people who complain that they never hear about events but also don't promote the events they do hear about. I have a few ideas on how to actively include new LARPers in your events and reach broader audiences in general, but honestly, uh, that still needs work and is probably another video. Instead, let's talk about websites, Facebook groups, and information flow. LARPs are bad at communicating information. LARPs also, apparently, refuse to learn from other LARPs and instead constantly outperform each other to come up with new, weirder ways to be bad at communicating information. Here is a non-ordered list giving examples of what I mean. Only posting updates to the Facebook group, where people can also so froth and it's not clear which posts are updates. Only sending updates out by email. Only sending updates out by email and not having perfect email list maintenance or hygiene. Not having a website at all. Having a website that is never updated. Having a website that is extremely difficult to read and navigate. Having a website that has all the rules but not when, where or how to book the event. Only having a wiki and not a rule book. Only having a 200 page poorly formatted rule book. Only having a 200 page rule book that is no longer current and never updated so you have to find all of the updates in random files on a Facebook group. Creating a new Facebook group for some reason and telling everyone to move over to the new one if they want to keep getting updates about the game. Creating multiple Facebook groups for specific categories of information and expecting people to find and join all of them. Only posting updates 
on Discord. Uh, Discord is terrible for basically everything except tabletop role-playing games at specific times. I will die on this hill. I am not monitoring a stream of consciousness asynchronous communication platform 24-7 in case you decide to post an announcement or scrolling back through seven hours of froth from other players to check whether or not you did that thing. Stop it with the Discord, seriously. So what's best practice? Honestly, at this point, I'm not sure there is one. Again, that might be another video. But some basic principles. Never have a single point of failure, but have information as few places as possible. Never have so much stuff that you can't update it all simultaneously. Always make sure that each version of your information is as complete as it can be and that all the important details, the rules, when and where your event is, booking deadlines, catering information, relevant forms, etc., are stored or linked to in all the places you hold information. You never know who will stumble across your website and want to come to the event but not be able to because you've only linked the booking form in your character TikTok account or whatever. Part nine, the park. So in this section, Jenny flags up something really important, which is that accessibility is not actually a checkbox you can just tick off. Evermore can be ADA compliant and also a nightmare to navigate in the dark because accessibility is not just mobility issues. And honestly, I'm tired of trying to explain to LARPs that they can't just go, mm, it's a forest, what do you expect? You've clearly been to the site if you've booked it, right? You should be making an itemized breakdown of what the site has and doesn't have and yes, Step-free access and accessible bathrooms are one thing, but lighting, player access to fridges, kitchen facilities, how many people are in a bedroom, how many of those beds are top bunks, private or communal bathrooms. All of this is important, and you have to remember that we live in an ableist society, and for a lot of people with access needs, feeling guilty about being weird and having to ask for stuff is the default state of being. So either they won't come, or they'll have a rubbish time when you're like, I don't understand why you need this, and they have to explain to you why they need fridge space or a private bathroom, which is really personal and invasive to demand from people. No, this has never happened. You don't know what all the access requirements might possibly be, and no one site is going to be perfectly accessible to everyone. So it's on you to take very detailed site information and verify it with your own eyes, not to take the site runner's word for it. Part 10, gameplay. I'm going hat free for this section because I've, I care about it a lot. Yeah, I think it's time to talk about giving all players a roughly equivalent experience. Evermore found out two things the hard way. One, if cool things don't happen to everyone, it's possible the guests will just not experience any cool things on their visit and feel like they missed out. And two, chosen one plot sucks. <laughs> Writing encounters for a LARP is not an easy job. There's a lot of factors that only really come up in LARP where people are both physically and mentally independent as well as invested in the story and characters. If you need a specific character for some plot, you have no guarantee you'll be able to find them, that they won't be off having a nap, that they haven't already nommed most of the plot you've put out, and now you're seriously neglecting other the players. You also run into one of the other Evermore issues. I was uh, horrified to learn that special quests and more in-depth character interactions were rolled out for particularly dedicated fans, but to be honest I'm not sure how they'd know that is bad form because loads of LARPs do that too. Let me break this down for everyone who's thinking about writing LARP plot anytime soon. One, every player should have a roughly equivalent opportunity to do, see, and be involved in cool stuff. If you're putting effort into big set pieces, why should they be exclusive? Why not let everyone come watch? If you're running out linears or little quests and groups. Run enough of them so it's actually really difficult for one person to go on all of them. And make sure they're about equal in terms of excitement, risk, and reward. Bad example of this, the combat characters get to go roll an enemy camp and rescue an NPC, and the non-combat characters get to go look through the woods for random tokens. I mean, forage for herbs. Good example of this. You can fight monsters with swords, you can fight monsters by beating them at children's board games. Both of these have the potential to seriously hurt your character and acquire that sweet, sweet healing roleplay, but both of these also let you defeat the monsters and steal their loot. This also means that if you're handing out extras like clues or benefits, you either need to make sure everyone gets something, prioritize the people who aren't the most stuck into the plot and benefiting from the game as a whole, or make it inconsequential enough that nobody minds too much that they didn't get one. So if dreams are weird and vague and don't mean much, yeah, you can pick a random sample of people to get them. They'll be able to tell other people about their weird dreams, and maybe if someone collates them all, they'll reinforce some of their assumptions about the big bad. But it's not actually a plot drop. If dreams are actual plot points and you're only giving them to some people, either they should be the people who don't seem to be super involved, and you should know who those people are, you need some mechanism for keeping tabs on your player base, or the other people should get some other kind of hint or plot drop, not necessarily at the same time. Maybe some people start with dreams, 
dreams, some other people have dreams on the Friday night, some people get letters that arrive at various points during the game. All of these have some kind of clue or hint or thing to investigate in it. Two, chosen one plot. A chosen one plot is anything where one character or a very small number of characters, like less than five, out of the player base is singled out as the only person who gets to or can do a specific major plot beat that the whole story leads up to. Only one person can fight the dragon, only one person gets to become a god or king of fairyland, only one person gets out of here alive, only one team wins the best warrior competition, only one person gets to go into the crypt and take the master sword and be the rallying cry for the revolution, only one person gets to find out the truth through a personalised roleplay experience. Evermore learned the hard way that no one likes chosen one plot except the chosen one. This is not a competitive hobby. If I go to a climbing competition and I lose, that sucks and I will go and get better at climbing for next time. You can't get better at doing LARP so you win next time, especially when the methods for choosing a chosen one are arbitrary and usually how good a friend or popular a LARPer that person is. Also I've paid six quid for this climbing competition and I still got to climb just as much as everyone else, not £150 for a weekend of watching someone else be the special. I don't even mind in-character competitions like tournaments or I don't know, in character rap battles, as long as it's not the main thing going on or how you're going to resolve the main plot for that game. Or unless this competition was like the main selling point of your LARP and everyone knows that's the main thing that's happening. I don't necessarily recommend that. Have you met LARPers? Sore losers. In short, chosen one plot lines are fundamentally incompatible with LARPing as a collaborative hobby. And yet they keep happening because they're lazy and easy and writing special plot for one person doesn't take all that long, unlike writing special individual plot for 35 people. A chosen one plot represents a supreme lack of effort on the part of the game writers and we should start treating it as such instead of being excited that we were the special one or bitter because we weren't. Three, you can't write special bespoke encounters just for your friends. If you want to write special bespoke plot just for your friends, you should be running invite only games for just your friends. But people don't because they want the kudos of running a proper 40 player LARP game, but their friends are coming, so they'll do something cool specifically for them. And now every other player is like, I'm sorry, am I just funding your special game just for your friends? I'm not salty, you're salty. I can hear you asking the question of, does that mean every single encounter, linear and quest in a LARP has to be equivalent? And no, that's not what I'm saying. There will be big major story events and there will be fun filler quests. You just want to make sure that those are evenly distributed among the player base, so it's not that a small group of people get all the cool major events and everyone else just gets filler. If only six people can fit into the crypt, then it makes sense that only about six people can do the ritual to put the ghost of the old queen to rest. Making the ghost of the old queen invite the person whose backstory says they're her descendant into getting flack for it that whole game. And a couple of people who've put the most time and effort into interacting with her, perhaps when other people were off doing other set piece quests. And then they can invite more people to make up the numbers. That makes those people feel like what they did was worthwhile and other people can be off doing other things. Maybe there's a big combat encounter at the same time and the outcome of the combat encounter relies on this ritual going off, but if they don't fight the monsters, they'll slaughter the village before the ritual is complete. Like, that took me three seconds. You have months to work on this LARP. If the barrier to going on the crypt quest is having completed the other three quests that day, a small number of people have done all the awesome set piece adventures while everyone else waits around to see how they did. If a small number of players munching all the plot is an issue in your game, making it so that the other big set piece quests actually disqualify you from some of the other ones is a valid strategy. Maybe you can't go in the crypt if you've killed anything that day. Sorry, combat characters. And the absolute worst case scenario is that you already decided who was going to get the Ghost Queen ritual ahead of time because they're your mates or the most established players and you want to do something special specifically for them or reward their character creation choices or the person playing the Ghost Queen only wants to interact with their friends or you make every problem only solvable by one skill set which just happens to be the one you gave to that one person who everyone treats like a celebrity because they're well known in that other game or something. I don't actually you know, the whole phenomenon of well-known LARPers is weird to me. Favouritism in LARP is a whole thing, and like the Chosen One plot, I don't think it's usually done maliciously, I think it's just easy and people want to be nice to their friends. Again, let me reiterate, nobody is stopping you from running a LARP for your five friends, where you make them the special. It becomes a problem when you allow 25 other people to pay you to watch your five friends be the special, while under the impression there would be game for them. Part 11. 
quests. Jenny laid out three different kinds of quests to Evermore. Concrete quests, where you do a thing and get proof. Vague quests, where you do a thing probably and we take your word that you did it. And nonsense quests. Let's imagine a game where each player is getting an individual personalised scene. It's not going to be long or complex, it's just a nice little something. A small handful of players get an elaborate vision sequence or backstory flashback and it's tied into their character background and a couple of them affect the plot in some way. But even if not, it's like a big character moment that lets them have a really dramatic scene and clearly present a decision that make that really affect this character. A lot of players get less dramatic and specific and slightly more surreal dream sequences where the levers are not that clear and it's a fun scene but it's not super obvious what the point is or why the scene was given to them or how it's relevant and it may change how they play this character but equally it might not. It's it's a bit vague uh, and some players get an empty room. It, it was me, I got the empty room. I'm not even joking. It wasn't a mistake. That's what they wrote for my character. I think it's pretty obvious what the issues with that are, but also nonsense quests can turn up in regular LARP games, and I think it's really important to acknowledge the difference between a frivolous or whimsical puzzle and a nonsense quest. I really like thinking of LARP as a series of puzzles because as far as I'm concerned, entertainment peaked with a crystal maze, and that's how I design encounters. Dealing with an NPC is a social puzzle. A combat encounter is a fighting puzzle. Putting clues together is a mental puzzle. Cracking a cryptography code is bullshit and shouldn't be in a LARP game ever. But there should be roughly equal numbers of puzzles, taking into consideration the number of players who are spec'd to engage in each kind of puzzle, and all the puzzles should give roughly equivalent rewards. There is nothing worse than the reward for a purely roleplay encounter being you got to talk to an NPC. Like I'm sinking all this energy into solving your problems, you better at least give me a clue or a resolution or some emotional beat, like some sense of accomplishment. Not everything is a LARP needs to be super serious and depending on the tone of your LARP you might have an occasional light-hearted encounter or you might have a series of hilariously silly quests. But there's a fine line between silly and still fun and do this thing players because I told you you should and no one's actually enjoying it. An incomplete list of silly encounters I have taken part in or witnessed and deeply enjoyed. The whole player base being undercover and therefore having to conduct interviews for a new gardener while unknown to the interviewees supernatural forces were kicking down the door. Comforting a giraffe. Having a duel over the correct pronunciation of scone. Making friendship bracelets. Being invited to a meeting and that meeting turning out to be a tea party with loads of donuts. Loads. Having to dispose of a body while undercover and fully weekend at Bernie's in that thing. Blowing our secret identities by getting high and arguing about the themes in Twelfth Night. Going to see a dragon and instead meeting a belligerent head teacher. Explaining the optimised Dungeons and Dragons party makeup to some actual adventurers going down a dungeon. Explaining to multiple people why they, their dogs, them again in a disguise, or the skulls of their parents could not vote in an election. An incomplete list of silly encounters I have been forced to take part in or witness and thought this was a waste of time literally the whole time it was happening. A village fate that was so loud and chaotic nobody knew what was going on, what the plot or objectives were, it was almost impossible to talk to anyone, we really weren't sure what we were supposed to be doing literally 90% of the time. But everyone was very loud. Being actively stopped in the middle of intense discussions several hours into trying to work out the overarching magical theory of the game to have a formal debate on a subject none of us cared about because a newspaper wanted it or something. Being stopped in the middle of... I think we were planning a funeral, like it was something big, to judge a goblin beauty contest. Going to fix a broken generator, only to have the ref gesture at a blank wall and say, yes, you can clearly see it's broken, no, you can't fix it, it's not possible. Quests specifically designed to use our specific skills written for our specific characters, except that many of our specific skills were possible to just hard skill, or the quests were specifically designed to reveal no information or give us no benefits. Some of them were just red herrings. It's fine for the tone of a quest or puzzle to be silly or light-hearted, or even for it to not be written that way, but for some reason the players find it hilarious, because we're naturally funny creatures, and because nothing will make the gruesome death of a character more poignant than remembering that an hour ago you were all laughing together about donuts. But all quests should be optional, all quests should have a clearly communicated purpose, all quests should have a reward, whether that reward is tangible or story-based, like not blowing your cover, or preventing voter fraud, because in principle we all believe even fair elections. We should have committed voter fraud at that game, I'm mad I didn't think of it. Part 12, attractions. There's a lot in this section that I enjoyed is maybe the wrong word, but the bit I want to talk about specifically is the glowing dragon. The glowing dragon in the corner that was allegedly made by fans. The glowing dragon where it was not clear whether or not the creators had been compensated for their labour. That dragon. LARP organisers are heroically bad at commissioning stuff. Things normally go one of several ways. We need this specific prop, so I will make it myself. We need this specific prop, so I will tell the crew we need it and hope one of them makes it for free. Uh, I hate this one specifically. 
basically. I am willing to commission this prop, but I have lowballed how much it would cost, and I cannot find anyone who will do it for that amount. I am willing to commission this prop, but I've left it way too late. I am willing to commission this prop, but I have not made any effort to find someone who could make it for me, and am instead waiting for someone to, I don't know, come out of the ether because they telepathically realized I needed it. If you have key props, you should be assuming that you need to pay for them, even if the person making them is a crew member or yourself. If you're a game runner, maybe consider you have better things to do with your time than make props. And if you aren't in a position to hunt down and commission someone early, you need to delegate that to someone who can. It's that simple. I use this hat in a really short section. This is a good hat. Part 13, characters, actors, and NPCs. A lot of the pitfalls in Evermore's current model, or at least current to when Jenny went, seem to be that they do not, or not in any reasonable capacity, brief their actors. At LARP games, we ask a lot of NPCs. And honestly, if you get really experienced crew, they will cover for the fact you haven't briefed them properly. But you also need to accept that whatever your crew improvised is canon now. There are unicorns in the Eastern Forest and they killed Dave's entire family, so now the players want to beat up some unicorns. Make it happen, Mehdref. In general, if you want your players to have a good experience for your game to flow the way you want it to, you need to properly brief your NPC so they aren't making up stuff on the spot, but they also know where the spaces are. Even down to the level where players recognize who's on your crew but don't know which characters are plot drop characters and which are R&R &R characters. So over dinner, my ask difficult questions like, what's your name? And why are you here? And I'm like, I just wanted soup. But if I know there's a big bandit fight planned for later in the afternoon, I can be like, oh, I, I've lost my home to bandits and the cook kindly let me in to have some food. And over the course of the next half an hour, the players who want to can become really invested in defeating these bandits. That wasn't the plan. I went for lunch. But I knew that was something I could foreshadow because I'd been briefed it was going to happen. Unlike if I didn't know anything and had to either be nobody with nothing interesting to say and maybe get ignored all lunchtime, or if I'd panicked and gone, my whole family was murdered by unicorns. Now the bit we don't say out loud is that not every crew member gets trusted with big plot. And that's okay. If someone's new, send them out with another crew member or with clear, concise instructions and to come back once they've ticked off all the things they need to do. If someone is consistently hanging out for hours in the player base, making up nonsense and causing problems, stop letting them be on crew. Also, do not, under any circumstances, as a game runner, follow your NPCs around and tell them what to say. If they need to check in with you for a quick question or something because the players have gone off on an odd angle you didn't expect, and you're just there in case, that's cool. But I've seen people literally ask their NPCs to repeat what they've said verbatim every time. It's so awkward and obvious, and it not only really damages the player experience, it shows you up as an incompetent game runner who can't write a brief. Oh, one more flashback to the Jenny video. LARP doesn't have the weird power dynamics you have going on in a corporate scenario. Oh man, I wish that was true. <laughs> Realistically, LARP has different weird power dynamics, but oh boy, there are weird power dynamics and they are weird. A lot of these fall under the heading of what people generally know is bad, but happens anyway, so I'm not going to belabor that too much. They're hating people for their characters, actions, so on and so forth. What I am going to flag up is the way parasocial relationships happen in LARP. Have you ever seen those studies where they talk about how many hours it takes to make a friend? It's like 50 to be a casual friend, 90 to be a real friend, maybe 200 to form a deep friendship. It's why it seems to be really easy to make friends when you were at school, but like, as a grown-up, it's real hard. 90 hours is two weekend LARP events. LARP events are high intensity, right? You're fighting for your lives and potentially actively pretending to have a closer relationship than you already do. We joke about how LARP is speed running friendship, but it's true. Except, for 40 of those 45 hours, you were both pretending to be different people. The person you've been friends with is not necessarily the person you've now just offered to share a car or a tent or a house with outside of the game. And some people remember that, and some people message me and ask if they can borrow my clothes for a game I'm not even going to when we've met once and not really interacted out of character. LARP is a very insular community, and I think it's really important to keep sight of the fact that we're not all good friends, and we don't actually know each other very well in almost all cases. Part 14, theatrical exemptions. Ah! LARP is not a theatre production, we have to stop pretending it is. Okay, so in the Evermore video, Jenny talks about pyrotechnics, and to LARP's credit, at least here in the UK, I've only ever seen pyro handled by people with actual licences. Not to say it doesn't happen, I'm like 90% sure it does, but I haven't seen it. You know what does happen all the time, everywhere? 
prop guns. If you're not familiar with gun laws in the UK, they are draconian and for good reason. So much so that even realistic looking prop guns are illegal except under very specific circumstances, such as TV or theatre, specifically licensed airsoft sites where I think you also have to have a personal license, things like that. LARP games sometimes allow realistic looking prop guns under the mantle of theatrical exception. I think this is bullshit. Not because of any links between LARP or theatre or whether LARP counts as improv theatre, but because theatre productions don't just let actors bring their own props from home, especially when those props are legally regulated. Weapon props in theatre have to be specially stored, transported in locked, marked containers, counted in and out of the weapons cabinet. For a theatre production, you can't just shove an unloaded airsoft rifle into the bottom of your suitcase, take it on public transport, take it out whenever you feel like, often without having to flag it to the organisers, and leave it lying around the rented venue for anyone to see or pick up. You don't have to change the appearance of a realistic prop gun by much to make it legal, and you don't have to change the appearance of Nerf guns by very much at all. We should not be allowing realistic gun props at LARP at all and we should normalise stricter safety protocols around legal LARP weapons, like transporting them in specifically labelled boxes and bags. Because trust me, people have ended up talking to the police enough times. Part 15 food. Themed menus are always bad. I have never had a themed menu that was good. I've never heard of a themed menu that was good. It is a waste of your time and the caterer's time and everyone's money. Just make normal food that you know people will eat and like and that covers everyone's dietary requirements. Also like this isn't rocket science. Breakfast, fried things or rather oven baked things but you know maybe porridge, lots of bread and bread adjacent foods, cornflakes if you're desperate, lunch, buffet, soup or jacket potatoes if you want a hot buffet component, it can even be individual packet soups in a kettle, but equally if you just put out a load of like bread and bread adjacent foods, sandwich fillings, hummus, falafel, salad vegetables, little nibbles, cakes, biscuits, chocolate crisps, maybe a quiche, done. Dinner. Some kind of carb with some kind of easily batch cooked protein and vegetable, maybe a sauce, followed by a dessert. Rice or potatoes, curry or chilli, or stew with dumplings, or pie, maybe lasagna, I don't know, lasagna is a faff. Some individually cooked protein and veg all separated so people can pick and choose. Those should not be fancy or highly seasoned or in complex sauces. Lots of bread and bread adjacent foods, follow it up with some kind of filling dessert like crumble or bread pudding or pie. To be honest, serve the lunch leftovers at dinner, serve last night's dinner leftovers, with lunch. Tea, coffee, squash and snacks at all times. There is no reason that menu cannot be completely vegetarian, probably vegan at a push. You should obviously have gluten-free bread and bread adjacent products. You should obviously have vegan protein options but also, guys, protein is important but it's not like the primary thing your body needs. I have been to some games that went to stupid lengths to give us extra protein in every food item. Tofu whisked into mashed potatoes ruining the one recognisable food in this god-awful themed menu. And that's just not how bodies work. Unless you are actively building muscle, you don't need a huge amount of protein. If you are actively building muscle, the window for getting into your body is actually pretty small for most use cases. And breaking protein down for energy, like complex carbs, is something your body only does when it absolutely has to. And at an indoor game with no or limited combat, trust me, it doesn't have to. When people complain that your vegetarian menu was too low in protein and that that's why they're craving meat, usually what you're craving is salt and fat. Vegetarians are not always great on fat. So I guess what I'm saying is your LARP menu should be high calorie and well seasoned which yeah no I, I stand by that. Part 16 priorities. Here is an incomplete list of things I have received from or interacted with at LARPs. Well made in character themed pronoun pins that were not super visible in the low lights of the venue. Handwritten, typed or wax sealed invites literally posted to me. Most of these were in fact completely generic invites that conveyed no information and only one of them contained an actual like plot relevant clue uh, that was encoded in the letter and thus I did not get because codes are stupid. Elaborate 3D printed tokens. Scented objects. I have a very minimal sense of smell so maybe this was really cool to a small subset of people but everyone I talked to was like, wait that was scented? Literal antiques. Elaborate light up props that didn't work or broke part way through the LARP. Custom puppets that appeared for a single scene. Embroidered patches that I only received as the game was starting and was not prepared to like attach to my costume. Uh, a t-shirt that I didn't want that also cost extra. Yeah, I'm, I'm still confused about that one. Special soap in the bathrooms. Really elaborate ref costumes or really elaborate custom made costumes for specific NPCs. An actual spinning wheel, which I'm sure they borrowed but also I know how much those cost and uh, I wouldn't let a bunch of LARPers near mine. A box of things with no explanation but a hint that you could figure stuff out about the LARP from investigating them properly. Nope, I bet some of it was in code. I couldn't be bothered. Gamer lights. 
a gramophone record player. This was actually pretty cool and actually plot relevant, I just know that they're expensive. In character menus, I am not letting this go. I don't care if you're colouring dessert blue or doing actual rationing or claiming some kind of incredible in character food that is actually unflavoured lentil stew in a slow cooker. It's bad, you are wasting your money, nobody likes it, sort it out. LARP, like Evermore, has a real problem with spending money on stuff that sounds cool but doesn't actually translate to an improved game experience, and then not spending money on stuff like essential props or things that make a measurable improvement to player and crew experience. This ties into my earlier point about budgeting. I think we deserve to know what you're spending money on or what you're getting for free, because if you spent £500 on a custom weapon for your big bad that coincidentally the game runner will keep at the end of the event, but haven't budgeted anything for printing costs when there's literally hundreds of printed pages in this game, or are losing crew because they can't afford to pay for their own catering, you need to figure out what is essential and what cannot in good faith be accepted for free. Players chipping in to wash the dishes? Great. Players chipping in to feed your crew because you spent all that budget on trading cards? Bad. Part 17. Suggestions. Here is an incomplete and non-ordered summary list. Write your game before you pitch it. Don't book games that sound sketchy or where the game runner is a known bad actor. Book venues that actually work for your game, not that just look cool. Playtest your game and workshop the names of things. Record and publish your budget and pay for things as much as you can. Don't expect free labour, be respectful and thankful when you get it, and prioritise the things that actually matter, not that you think are cool. Stop using other people's intellectual property without permission. Think about your information flow plan and maintain it. Think about accessibility and bake that into your game design and site visits. Adopt the crystal maze model of game design. There's variety in tone, complexity and content, but all players get roughly the same amount of screen time, and the risks and rewards for each player are roughly equivalent. Brief your crew. Trust your crew. Recognise the power imbalances inherent in LARP. LARP is not theatre, and breaking the law is a bad look no matter what. No themed menus. Not even once. Part 18. The Conclusion. <laughs> I'm free! I hope you've enjoyed this video, and I swear, next one is a sewing video again. I can't keep doing these video essays, they take so long to research and write, and this one was real rushed. If you enjoyed this and you'd like to stick around, I'd love it if you subscribed. Don't forget to like the video and leave a comment to keep the YouTube gods happy. Follow me on Instagram if you want to see pictures of my cat, and down in the description box you'll find a link to my Ko-fi page. Ko-fi supporters get early access to all of my videos, and permanent access to anything I unlist after a while, like live recordings. Dream big, and I'll see you next time. Oh, he's so unhappy. Aren't you? Ooh. Sir. Ooh. That's a tiny squeak. You're, you're adoring audience. No, no, no. Doesn't like it. Hey, you.